Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about how to animate your shader graph using Timeline. Setting up Timeline to animate a shader graph is relatively straightforward once you have the code in place. I will give you the code on GitHub, but I'm also going to show you how to do it. So in the process, I'm not only going to show you how to use Timeline to animate a shader graph, but how to use code. I'm Game Dev Bill. Let's get started. Timeline is Unity's sequencing tool. Out of the box, it lets you do things like positions and arrangements and move things around and have a lot of animations that you can control. Especially if you use it in conjunction with Cinemachine, you can have really good control over your camera placement and movement and all kinds of cinematic effects. It doesn't, however, support shaders out of the box. And that's what we're gonna fix today. Most of the time when you're creating a shader, you're doing it so that you can have something animating, something living and dynamic and moving. In all of my tutorials so far, I've used a time node inside the shader graph to do the animation. This works really well if you have something that's just going on forever or doing some kind of loop. But if you need to trigger it from code, control how it's moving, how the speed is going, and what's going on from outside of the shader graph, timeline is a really good way to do that. Now, some of you may not want to really understand what's going on in the code, and that's fine. I've put it up on GitHub. You can pull down four code files that will get you ready and using timeline immediately. I've also created a written version of this tutorial. It's available on my website, so you can follow along there if it's easier to read than to watch this video. Be sure to check the description below for links both to my GitHub, to the written tutorial, and to anything else that might be relevant today. Since today's tutorial is more about timeline than it is shader graph, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time creating a shader for us to manipulate. I'm going to start with a shader from an old tutorial tweak it as needed, and then move into timeline. The shader I'm gonna start with is from a tutorial on how to create a shockwave shader graph. I've got a link up here, and I'll have a link in the description. I'll be changing a few things as we go, but the first one is that I've actually updated in this project, I've updated to a newer version of shader graph. I was using version eight in my previous tutorial, and in this new one, I'll be using version 10 of shader graph. A few things are different. One I want to call out is when you're creating the shader, uh, where you create it and what it's called is moved. It's now going to be, you right click, you can do create, shader, now universal render pipeline and lit shader graph. Before that was called PBR shader graph in version eight, but they're the same thing. With the shader hooked up to the material, I'm gonna open up the shader graph, but I'm gonna fast forward to already being set up where I left off in the last tutorial. The shockwave tutorial finished basically looking like what we see here. Now, the difference is this version is in the newer shader graph, uh, which really the only visual difference you'll see here is that the master node, in version eight, there's a single master node in shader graph. In version 10, the master node is split up into these different kind of uh, little pieces, but otherwise it's basically the same. Before I get into setting this graph up for timeline, I'm gonna tweak a couple of things, mainly because people asked about them in my shockwave tutorial. The shockwave was done on a shield, and it was a very 2D effect, even though it was done on a 3D object, because the shield is fairly flat. So in this demo, I'm gonna be using the shockwave tutorial on a helmet, and I'm gonna do it in kind of a 3D way. So I'm gonna update that before getting to the timeline thing, just because people wanted to see it, so I figured I'd slip it in now. So the first thing I change is the focal point. In my flat shield, that focal point could be a two-dimensional thing because I just cared about where I was on the surface of the shield. For this helmet, I need it to be 3D. So I delete the input called focal point, and then I create a new input called focal point that's a vector three. I drag that into the graph, and then because I care about three dimensions, I don't need to do this split and combine that I was doing before. I can just take the position and my focal point and feed them both directly into the subtract. With the focal point set up as being three-dimensional, I now need to just change the logic a little bit. Previously, the logic had been moving out in the Y direction from my shield, regardless of where it was on the shield because my shield was flat. In this, my helmet is round, so I want it to always move out of the helmet, which happens to be the normal direction. So I'm gonna use the normal to drive how the shockwave is moving. So I come to the very end of the graph, delete my logic that was taking the position and just adding to the Y component. I delete that split and combine, and I feed my position directly into the add. Now it was feeding into the add, I need to delete, and I need to adjust a little bit based on the normal. So I'll add a node called normal vector, 
And then I need to set that node to be an object space because I don't care where the helmet is in my scene. I just care that relative to itself, the normals are pointing outwards and that's how I want the shockwave to point. So I take that normal vector in object space, multiply it by the strength of my wave, that's what's coming in here, and feed that into the add. I can come over into my material, tweak some numbers to make sure it looks right, and I'm also gonna adjust the focal point because I want it to be emanating from the forehead of the helmet rather than the center. Okay, so we've got a shader looking the way we want. It's animating in a loop using time, but now we wanna drive that externally. As I mentioned at the beginning, timeline is just code-driven shaders, but built into the timeline system. So before getting into actually using timeline, I'm gonna show you how to do this in code. I'm gonna go over it kind of quickly because you're probably watching this video if you wanna know how to use timeline, but this framework helps understand what's going on. But either way, whether we're driving it from timeline or from code, the things we change in the graph are the same. So I'm gonna start there. In the shader graph, I'm gonna add an input that I'm gonna call percent. It's gonna be a float. Now, if you were using shader graph version eight, they call it a vector one, now they call it a float. I take my percent input, I drag it in, and I just feed it in where I had been using time. With the output of the time feeding into that fraction node, I'm just gonna disconnect that and feed my percent input directly in there. And now we need to set the ever important reference. If you're using shader graph eight, you just use the blackboard where you add the input, you set its reference. If you're using shader graph 10, like I am here, you have to open the graph inspector, select the input and look at the node settings. And that's where the reference shows up. I'm gonna call this underscore percent. That's just the standard naming convention. You actually can call it whatever you want, but the normal kind of convention is to do underscore and then whatever the variable name is. So I take the helmet that I'm gonna drive with code and add a new script to it. I'm calling this script helmet trigger. In my update function here, I'm gonna give you the actual only one line of code you really care about. And that is on the material I call set float. And the first parameter is the name of the variable, that reference name of the variable, so underscore percent. And then the second is just the value I'm setting. In my case, I'm gonna use my internal variable underscore percentage. Uh, that's really all you need to drive shader values from code is that material dot set float. It could be set float, set vector, set color. These are all exposed based on the type you need and whatever type you're using, you just use the appropriate set method. Just to make it actually do something, I'm gonna add a little bit of logic here. In the start method, I'm, I'm gonna grab the material from this object. So I try to get the mesh renderer and I get the material from it. And I'm gonna set this up here in my update function. I'm gonna say, if I've already fired, which in this case, it will be the space bar key in a little bit, I'm gonna grow the percentage by the delta time, which is since last frame. I divide by duration so that it controls how quickly it goes. And then I just feed that into my set float. Once my percentage reaches one, I'm gonna kill the effect and start over. And then after that, I just say, if someone hits the space bar, then let's start this event. And it's working. The helmet that's being driven from code animates as I hit the space bar, but the other helmet that's waiting to be set up for timeline is just sitting there idly. All right, now it's time to get the timeline pieces set up. Again, I'm gonna walk through the code a little bit here. It's on GitHub if you just wanna grab it, but I wanna make sure you understand how it works because there might be places that you need to customize it or tweak it a little bit. And if you understand how it works, it's much easier to do. So there's four code files we're gonna make. But first, let me talk about the kind of pieces of timeline. So looking at this graphic here, the whole row in timeline is called a track. That track is gonna know what it's operating on and how to do that operation. But that's called the track. So that's one piece of code we're gonna have to make. The next thing I'm highlighting here is the control asset. This is the individual piece added to the track. Each track will have multiple control assets. And this one actually reflects two code files. There's one to represent the data in the editor, and there's another one to represent the data at runtime. But either way, these two files are just data. They're just holding the data. The track holds all the pieces of data, and then we've got two files to represent the data. And the fourth file we need to create is the mixer. This is what handles control assets that are overlapping. So basically every frame, the track says, hey mixer, here's what assets I have, here's what data I have right now, you figure out what we should actually do. So the fourth file, the mixer, that's the most relevant, that's the one that's actually doing our logic. I'm gonna create four C-sharp code files. I'm gonna call the track, I'm gonna call shader track. 
The two data ones I'm going to call shader playable and shader control asset. The playable is the runtime representation. The control asset is what's used in the editor. And then lastly, I'm going to create shader mixer. Now to quickly go through what's in each code file. I'm going to start with the two data files because I actually need those set up first for the other classes to understand what's going on. So shader playable, that's the runtime data. All it has is a public float that I'm calling float val. The second thing I'm going to put code in here is the shader control asset. This is the editor representation of the data. And as such, it also has the job of creating the runtime data on the fly. So I overwrite a method called create playable. And all I really do in here is I create the shader playable. I'm also going to set its float value. And to do that, I need to add a float value to this asset. So both of my data representations have a variable called float val. The third code file we're going to look at is the shader track. There's not a ton going on here either, but I'll walk you through the pieces. It's got two attributes that I'm going to add to it. The first one defines what the data is going to be that you can add to this track. What's the control asset that this track can accept? So I'll say shader control asset. The next thing is it's going to say, what kind of object can I operate on? Whether that's a mono behavior or a component, what, what can this track operate on? And I'm going to say renderer. Of note, that makes it work for either a sprite renderer or a mesh renderer. I'm going to add a public variable, a string called shader var name. This is going to let me enter on the track in the editor, let me type in what the variable name is going to be, such as underscore percent. The other thing I do here is I override a method called create track mixer. Now I can't quite finish this method because the mixer class hasn't been implemented yet. So my autocomplete is going to be all broken. So I'm going to jump over to the mixer and then come back to here. In the mixer class, there's not going to be a lot to it. It's going to know the variable name that needs to set. And it's going to override a method called process frame. So every frame, it's going to be given some data. It's going to figure out what to do and then set that variable. So I loop over all the pieces of data that are passed in, getting their weights and create a weighted average. So if two pieces are overlapping and I'm just at the beginning of one, then it's going to be 90% of the first one and 10% of the second one or something like that. And then once I have that weighted average, I grab the material from my renderer and just call set float on it, just like I was doing in the code before. That's all the logic there is. Now I can jump back to the track real quick just to finish it. I'm going to make a script playable of type shader mixer. I'm going to take that and set the shader var name on it. Again, remember the track itself has a shader var name that I set in the editor, and the mixer has the shader var name that it's going to use. So when I create the mixer, I have to pass that data through. And then that's it. I'm ready to go back into the editor. Back in the editor now, we're going to finally use timeline. I know there's a lot of setup to get us here, but we're ready to roll. I'm going to create an empty game object in my scene. Then I open up the timeline window which is within window sequencing. And then the timeline window suggests, hey, you have something created. It doesn't have a timeline associated with it. Would you like to create a timeline asset? So I hit create and I give it a name, whatever I want. First thing I'm doing, going to do is add my track. So I right click and I add shader track. That's in the list because that code exists in our project. With that track in there, I can drag my mesh renderer onto it. I'm taking the actual helmet piece from my scene, dragging it in there, and then I'm going to right click within the track to add my shader control asset. I can resize it. I'm going to duplicate it a couple of times and set the middle one to a value of one and set the two edges to zero. I can then overlap them so that they'll animate from zero to one and back. Now I did forget on my actual track to set the variable type, so I need to go back to that select the track itself, and you see shader var name in the inspector. I'm going to set that to what I had in the shader, which was underscore percent. And with that, I can hit play, and I can see that the shockwave goes from center of the forehead out and then back in based on my animation. Now, I just have it set up on the main part of the helmet, so to get it on the horns, I need to duplicate this track and drag the horns into this other one. And now they're synced together. They'll both work. I can actually do this in play mode, or in the scene view by dragging the little slider. Uh, one thing is that it does spit out some errors in the console when I do that, because I do need to change one little thing in my code. Uh, if you are using timeline not in play mode, uh, this same code is going to be running. And if you're not in play mode, you don't actually want to get the material from the renderer. You want to get the shared material. So I do need to change the code 
a little bit here to say if, act if application is playing, uh, behave a little bit differently. As I mentioned at the beginning, all of this is up on GitHub along with a sample project. So I wanna talk a little bit about that now. The version on GitHub has a little more flexibility than what I implemented today. I just wanna talk about the differences. I won't really go into them. But in the version I did here, all you can set is a float value. On GitHub, I've set it up to take a float or a vector or a color. And in that GitHub project, I've set up a sample scene with a timeline in it where I'm driving those into a sample shader graph. The sample shader graph here, it's got three inputs. One is called float test, that's a float. One is a vector two called vector test, and one is a color called color test. Now, I wanna make a note about the vector. I'm using a vector two in this shader graph. The actual shader interface, the set vector that's on the material, that always expects a vector four. So my timeline data is expecting a vector four, and it doesn't matter if you're driving a vector two or vector three or vector four, you still put in a vector four as the data input. So in this demo project, I've got my single sprite with this one shader graph on it, and I'm gonna set up three tracks in the timeline. With the tracks in there, I can add control assets, I can make them overlap, and I can preview it in both play mode and just in the scene view. So one of the nice things about timeline is you don't have to go into play mode to see what's going on. You can scrub it manually to see how things look. And I made it so that on the track, the same place you're setting the shader variable name, you're also telling the track which type of variable to set. Because a given track can only set one thing. It could set the float or the vector or the color. And the reason I'm going into this now and the reason I walked through all the code leading up to this is that there's still even more data types that you could cover. So you might need to drive something other than those three. Those are gonna be the three most common, but you might need to drive something different. And I wanna make sure you understand what's going on, why the code's set up this way, so that you can customize it as you need it. Thanks again for watching. I had a lot of fun making this one. Please subscribe, tell your friends, loved ones, grandparents about this video series. Feel free to reach out in the comments if you have any questions. You can also hit me up at GameDevBill on Twitter, or if you need the written version of this tutorial or many of my other tutorials, they're all on GameDevBill.com. Again, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all of you.